Hi, I'm Christy Harkin. I've been Bitcoin Man uh, Magazine's managing editor for the past four years. With me is Andreas Antonopoulos, a longstanding Bitcoin evangelist and educator and author and speaker. Andreas, welcome to the Bitcoin Magazine having an uh, event. It's so great to have you here. Couldn't do it without you. Oh, thank you so much, Christy. It's a real pleasure. I've been a huge fan of Bitcoin Magazine ever since the first uh, first couple of uh, editions. In fact, I remember um, one of the first editions was uh, sold to me at a conference by a, a, a very nice young man uh, by the name of Vitalik Buterin. Right. Yeah. He, he started it all off and running and uh, we've taken it in lots of different directions since. So this is your third halving and uh, so we're going to be getting your perspective on the state of Bitcoin for each of those separate epochs and get some ideas of what you see coming in the next one, because goodness knows there's a lot of exciting stuff coming down the pipe. Absolutely. Yes. I, I was lucky to just about catch the first having in 2012. So uh, lots of excitement. I came in halfway, halfway between number two and number, uh, number two and number three. Mm -hmm. Or no, between number one and number two. Yeah, so this is, this is my second. So yeah, uh, it wasn't much of a big deal when we did the second one. I think, in fact, Aaron Van Verdum had an article saying we had the halving and not much happened. But it's always in the weeks and months and years that follow that things get interesting. So if you were to look at the first three and a half years or so of Bitcoin, four years, um, leading up to the, the uh, 2012 halving, how would you characterize that period? What was what would your impression of that be? Uh, I think those were the uh, obscure years. Uh, Bitcoin was very much in obscurity, and very very few people had even heard of it and uh, had any idea what it was. Uh, so the the user base was tiny. Um, the community was extremely small. Uh, I remember going to the first conference in San Jose and meeting basically everyone, uh, the entire Bitcoin community almost at the time that was uh, in the US was there. Um, and you, you could fit everybody in a room. Um, it was quite, quite tiny. There were a few interesting areas, little pockets of development. Um, mm -hmm. I know that I think by by uh, 2012, there was a London conference happening. Um, mm -hmm. There were some uh, meetup groups all sort of springing up in lots of different places. Were you involved in the meetup scene back then? Um, I had just started getting involved in the meetup scene. Yes, I co-founded uh, two meetups in uh, the San Francisco area, which is where I lived at the time. Yeah, and I think that now in terms of, say, development of um, things being built at the time, what were some of the more striking things from the, the pre-halving number one that really stood out as markers for you that showed that we were going to actually go somewhere with this? I was really excited at the time with a, um, a very interesting new technology called uh, P2SH or pay to script hash. Um, with the emergence of uh, a new form of address, which started with a three instead of a one, something that's very familiar to us now, but uh, in 2012, that was new. Uh, until then, uh, the types of scripts that you could put into uh, Bitcoin transactions were severely restricted. So there was a fundamental test that occurred in the system um, for standard scripts. There were a few standard scripts that were, uh, let's say, approved by the consensus rules. So after the initial launch of Bitcoin, developers went in and they identified a few uh, bugs um, that Satoshi had um, overlooked, uh, some edge cases, some mm, difficult scenarios that could emerge. And in order to protect against uh, certain types of bugs, um, the, uh, the code was changed and the Bitcoin script was restricted with um, a lot of the kind of more exotic capabilities disabled and the number of scripts allowed limited. And so by 2012, that started opening up uh, and things like multi-sig 
uh, really started uh, to expand at that point. So you, you, could, you could do some really interesting things with multisig as well as more complex scripts started becoming possible. And when you say that, that those kinds of developments really opened up things like multisig, why was that important? Why did that make Bitcoin more usable and more have more potential? Well, because um, when the, the primitive building blocks that are in the script language are expanded, um, it starts uh, kind of tickling the um, creative uh, brains of people who are thinking about these things, and they gradually come out with, with some really uh, strange, radical, and exotic ideas that then take years to come to fruition, but eventually uh, become um, very important innovations. So, um, for example, the use of uh, the op return parameter to um, be able to embed small amounts of data, which created the possibility of the first uh, second layer capabilities, uh, colored coins, counterparty, um, Omni or master coin as it was called at the time, which then uh, gave uh, people like Vitalik Buterin the idea of making more expressive scripts that led to Ethereum. A lot of people don't know that um, Vitalik started trying to build Ethereum as a layer on top of Bitcoin uh, using the Mastercoin um, layer. All of those capabilities opened up um, with the opening of the script types in 2012. So, uh, so the door opened then and then the innovations continued to trickle out. Um, SegWit and its uh, possibility of being implemented as a soft fork in 2017 was based upon uh, some of the peculiarities of the script language, uh, the Lightning Network, which appeared as a fully fledged idea with an implementation uh, design effectively um, two years, three years later, um, was based on the capabilities of complex scripts and multisig at that time. So it, it, it takes a while for primitives to become fully fledged ideas and for people to build interesting things with these um, building blocks and then for those ideas to become workable code and then deployed networks and then finally features in, in user wallets. Um, but those of us who are paying attention and, and kind of can see where things are going, when we see these doors opening at the primitive layers of the protocol, can kind of see where that might lead. Um, and so start imagining new things. I, when I was thinking about the first epoch, I started thinking of, like if I had to sort of put a chapter heading on it or something, I was thinking something along the lines of, what is this? Bitcoin, what is this? And yeah. what can we do with it? And yes. when we look at sort of the, uh, the timeline of things that did happen, you know, we're getting first experimentations with exchanges. We get our mm -hmm. first couple of bubbles. We get, um, uh, experimentation with different forms of wallets and you get the HD wallet starting to come in and how that opens everything up. Um, so if there was a lot of the whole, like you've just got a brand new toy, but you don't know what to do with it yet. And then yeah. following the second, in, if you, I mean, in a way, the halvings are kind of arbitrary benchmarks, if you like, it's all yeah. coded in and, and one thing doesn't necessarily lead to the other, but it's an, a, a useful parameter, I think, for us to think of these the discrete sections yes. as milestones and, and what can we say about the periods in between. Mm -hmm. um, so the second one I was thinking of in terms of, so from 2012 to 2016, sort of as an experiment build and break uh, mm -hmm. section, there was a lot of experimentation, a lot of building and a lot of breaking, a lot of, a lot of stuff went down in those <laughs> four years. Um, yes. There was, and a lot of uh, regulation started coming in. People outside started looking at Bitcoin and going, what is this and what do we have to do about it? In fact, the first encounter I had with you um, followed your speech to the Canadian Senate mm -hmm. on what was Bitcoin and how, uh, whether or not Canada should be regulating it. Um, so how would you look at, how would you look at that section, second period of Bitcoin? 
Well, the, the second period of Bitcoin, I think, is um, when people outside of the very, very small community started taking notice. And um, a lot of things, good and bad, happened. Um, I remember 2013 as being this absolute tornado of a year where so many things happened in one year uh, that... Um, it was a transformational year for my personal involvement in Bitcoin, um, but but also a lot of a lot of really um, shocking and exciting things happening. Um, and what really? We, what's what comes to mind specifically? What what is your what's the one thing that really stood out for you then? Well, uh, for for me, it was uh, back to back the appearances on the Canadian Senate floor as a witness, as well as um, shortly thereafter at the Joe Rogan uh, Experience podcast, which has an enormous audience and kind of uh, catapulted me into uh, um, recognition in a way that I wasn't really ready for. Uh, or anticipating. Um, it was the beginning of my work on Mastering Bitcoin, the book. Uh, it was um, the first big rally where people suddenly got um, uh, very excited. Some people got quite rich uh, and some people got quite greedy. And uh, that led to a a slight change in the perspective of outsiders who were now more attracted to the possibility of uh, quick riches. Um, it was the beginning of the first uh, altcoin and um, ICO fever. Um, and just, just an overall crazy year. Um, I, I also remember it was the first time we saw some real cracks in um, the ability of MT Gox, which at the time was an anchor kind of bedrock exchange, the only really big exchange that existed. Um, and it really creaked under the strain and threatened to fall over, which, which kind of presaged what was gonna come next, which was the biggest um, collapse of a custodial system in the history of Bitcoin. Yeah. The, the other thing that um, I think another kind of biggish event that happened right after was right after the, uh, the first halving was the takedown of Silk, Silk Road as well, which was yes. one of the first big, big use cases for Bitcoin. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and the shockwaves that sent through um, the, the community and um, forced people to um, reckon with the 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 moral uh ethical implications of this technology on both sides yeah those were two narratives that bitcoin really had to uh handle or deal with was the the silk road side and the collapse of mount gox so you had the whole that whole sort of bitcoin is for criminals and it's not safe which mm -hmm. i think that uh took several years really for bitcoin to really recover from and get change the story and change the narrative and, and prove its its actual value. Yes, it was a, it was a big uh, setback, um, which I think set, set back the whole narrative by probably a couple of years. Um, then again, what it also did was it took the steam out of um, uh, the, the speculation and the anticipation of riches which again allowed uh, the community to refocus. Um, but I, I find those periods, uh, the busts that follow the booms to be um, periods when um, there's a clear out in the community and a lot of the um, opportunists um, who have kind of flooded in in order to take advantage of the rapid rise in price and to stake a claim and things like that, they, they get washed out. Um, and what stays behind is people who may have entered the space looking for uh, some kind of uh, financial gain, but then are attracted to some of the principles and then stay and want to learn more about why it matters, why uh, it's not about the price, um, why it's about uh, openness and freedom and um, the lack of control and intervention and censorship. 
of the traditional financial system. And so we have some very good conversations. It's also a great time for those of us who are doing work in the space um, to be able to tone down the noise and, and really focus on what matters and get down to work. Um, because when the craziness is happening during the boom cycles, uh, there's too much noise and too much distraction. Um, and it, it's very difficult to, to get any real productive work done. So um, I ended up finishing my book uh, during the next two years um, and uh, got a lot of work done building kind of education. Um, and we, we did some of our best work. And I think the same thing applied with uh, the core developers who were working um, on a lot of different things. A lot of people produced some excellent work. The Lightning Network paper was published at that time. Um, Ethereum launched and uh, started a whole new um, interesting chapter in this saga. And, uh, and you know, uh, everybody got ready for the next boom cycle, the next halving, and it, it didn't take that long. And that's what I would have probably be, be labeling the third, the third epoch, the tw uh, 2016 to 2020 was boom and bust. Um, and also um, sort of the boom of the new financial products that started coming out. Um, I think right. that everything sort of, all of that initial interest that, keep, that, that started in the second epoch really exploded in the third one. And we got a lot of the institutional uh, interest in Bitcoin. Yes. Um... And it's more than just the institutional interest in Bitcoin. I think one, one of the things that happened that was really interesting is the second altcoin and ICO season, because yeah. everybody remembers the altcoin and ICO season in 2016, 2017, but most people forget that the first one happened in 13 and 14. Um, we, we had ICOs then, that's when the term was coined, uh, no right. pun intended. Uh, and then um, in, in 2016, 2017, what happened, however, was that uh, Ethereum proved uh, one of its fundamental propositions, which was that it made it so easy for anyone to tokenize anything. And with that came the, the double-edged sword that it made it so easy for anyone to tokenize anything that everyone tokenized everything, including things that shouldn't have been tokenized um, and outright scams. And we had the, a, a much bigger um, second round of altcoins, tokens, and ICOs. Um, and when uh, the space exploded uh, in financial terms in 2017, uh, that's when every shark in a suit piled on. Um, you know, some people yeah. like to call that the institutional interest in Bitcoin. Um, I think of it as sharks in suits circling at the smell of blood in the water and hoping to get a piece of chum for themselves. Uh, because it, the most of it wasn't serious institutional interest. It was uh, very, very opportunistic. We didn't get um, the, the creme de la creme of the financial services industry. Uh, what we got is the bottom feeders of the financial services industry, and they flooded. Uh, they but flooded. they've since a lot have been shaken out. And now and again, and as soon, yeah. Exactly. As soon yeah. as the boom turns to bust, um, all of those opportunists get wiped out and um, make grand pronouncements about how they never really believed in uh, Bitcoin. They're much more interested in blockchain, the technology behind Bitcoin, um, which is kind of a sour grapes response to failing to Lambo. Um, it's, it's really funny, but again, that gives us an opportunity then to um, batten down the hatches, focus on the important work, uh, educate the people who are willing to stay and learn about the principles, uh, get prepared for the next wave of newbies, um, and really start differentiating the signal from the noise. Uh, and, and again, it's a very productive period uh, for those of us working in the space. Uh, that's when the Lightning Network was actually built, was after the boom. Um, that's when uh, I finished my um, second book, Mastering Ethereum. I published a couple of books about uh, the internet of money in the meantime, but the second big technical book happened then. Um, and here we are again. 
so where are we going to go? What's, what's the one thing, pick, because real quick now, one thing that you are excited to see coming in the next epoch? Well, um, f first of all, I think uh, that the same prediction that I made the previous two uh, halvings applies again, which is that um, a whole lot of nothing is going to happen. And for now. For now, yeah. Um, because it, it, the monetary effects, if any, and I'm not an economist, so that's not my primary area of interest, the monetary effects take quite a while um, to make themselves felt in the market more than the speculative enthusiasm that, that kind of races ahead of any real fundamental change. So um, what we're seeing now is this kind of frothy excitement um, that doesn't have much substance to it, but that is overwhelming any possibility of getting some kind of signal from the market fundamentals. Uh, it's going to take a long time before the signal from the, from the fundamental change in the inflation rate of, of Bitcoin's issuance um, breaks through all of that noise and becomes the dominant signal that, that really is, is felt in the market. Um, but markets aside, what, what is exciting to you about what's going to be coming in the next couple of years? Well, um, I, I think the, the most exciting uh, two developments in this space are um, the changes to the underlying scripting language that are almost ready to deploy, and I hope they'll be deployed faster than our previous uh, change with SegWit. And those are Schnorr uh, signatures, uh, Taproot, and TapScript that come as a package of changes. Um, those open up, again, it's, as I mentioned before, as in the first era, um, they open the door. They create new building blocks on top of which a lot of exciting things can be built. Um, there's a couple of other potential changes to the scripting language that are being proposed that massively increase the flexibility of the scripting language without making it Turing complete. Uh, and those are very interesting. Um, the other area of development is the maturation of the Lightning Network. To me, the Lightning Network until now has been primarily a, a fairly raw and kludgy um, uh, protocol implementation, a prototype uh, that is gradually getting polished, but the rough edges have mostly been polished off. And uh, we're getting to a point where the user interfaces in the Lightning wallets, the infrastructure, the reliability of the system, the uh, consistency of the experience, et cetera, are beginning to uh, shine through. Um, all of the efforts got, that have gone into the last uh, two years of running production networks are bearing fruit. And I think that's going to monumentally impact how Bitcoin is used, how it's perceived, um, and um, really transform the environment. Uh, until now, a lot of what we were doing with Bitcoin, at least on the surface, um, was stuff that you could also do with traditional financial services. Uh, Lightning opens up a whole new dimension of time and space. Um, in terms of time, we're talking about transactions that take uh, less than a second uh, to be fully cleared, irreversible, and trusted, and um, where you can do thousands of transactions per second, uh, potentially. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the uh, opening up of the dimension of space, where until now, the minimum transaction you could do viably on Bitcoin was about a dollar to ten dollars, um, and we're going way below that to subcent transactions, true micropayments, and even nano payments uh, below that that open up a whole range of applications. What's interesting is that now we're talking about applications that are unprecedented, that simply do not have an equivalent in the traditional financial and payment industry. And once we start exploring those, that's when this technology really comes into fruition. That'll um, be really exciting to see in the next couple of years and, and beyond even, but it would be good yeah. to uh, resume this conversation again in another four years and see where we are and what else has popped up uh, as a you know really promising uh, development 
everything yeah. moves ex exponentially quickly as well from where things were every four years who knows where we're going to be in another four so yeah i think though um a lot of people are anticipating something momentous happening at the moment of the halving yeah. because it's been pumped <laughs> up by all of the reports and we talked earlier about milestones you know milestones um you know the word comes from markers that were put up uh, every mile on our on roman roads um right. and um just like when you when you pass a mile marker not much changes in the scenery um the having as a milestone will be completely uneventful in fact we hope it will be completely uneventful from a technical perspective technical. yeah the difference between block 629999 and 630000 um is going to be nothing um it's going to come across as a somewhat anticlimactic experience because within that experience, um, we will see the fundamental experience of Bitcoin. And the fundamental experience of Bitcoin is TikTok, new block. That's it. Perfect. It just, it just keeps doing that. Um, it, it's dead. It's about to die. It's for criminals. It's not for criminals. It should be regulated. It shouldn't be regulated. All of that noise. And in the meantime, what Bitcoin does in the background is TikTok, new block uh, and continues to chug along 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, completely and that's unstoppable. That and is that's what essence. is that's remarkable. Yeah. That's the and, remarkable thing about it. Exactly. And that's what's yeah. going to happen during the having. Nothing's going to happen because by design, nothing is yes. supposed to happen. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, once it's worked, then people can go back to, oh, it didn't die. Um, and um, now we can we can see what the economic impact might be or other things that will come as a side effect of that. Everyone will breathe a big sigh of relief, except for those of us who are kind of grizzled veterans who've been through this before. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll continue. And uh, everybody will forget all about the halving. And three and a half years from now, I'm going to be explaining it all over again to journalists that are going to be asking me about the possibility of a death spiral um, imminently, uh, which happens uh, so often when yeah. you know new people come across this technology and misunderstand it uh, quite dramatically. No, nope. that pretty much sums up, I guess, all of the good stuff. Thank you so much, Andreas, for doing this again, and um, we'll see you in another four years. Absolutely, thank you <laughs> okay. so much, Christy. I hope thank to be you. around then. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and share. All my work is shared for free, so if you want to support it, join me on Patreon.